with us. We're going to 2 Kings 22 before I go down a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> I might need God's deliverance to get back up out of there, right? <laughs> What's up? Oh, yeah. Um, and then any kind of donations that you might have, get with Angie on it. We are um, trying to put the nursery together. we got things painted down there. we got last bits of stuff of my stuff down there to move up here to this office because we finally got that done. And so we're in the transition of that. Um, and so um, here next month or so, um, our uh, family room will be turned into a nursery and then downstairs into the storm shelter area where they have kids church. That's all going to be done. And um, the whole kids area will be done. And um, yeah, and so that'll be exciting. So um, they're, you know, the nice thing about them being in a storm shelter, they're, they're in the safest place on the property. <laughs> it's us that are going to be running. <laughs> and if it's coming from that direction and we're running that direction, that might kind of weird. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you know, around here, you never know. <laughs> Second uh, Kings 22, verse 19 through 20. We're gonna, I'm gonna, my, my, what I want to talk about this morning. You'll see where we're going. Finding treasure. Finding treasure is what we're gonna talk about this morning. Um, I have this chewed on this all week, and uh, wow, it's some. Um, there's a lot in this passage. And I, I told the Lord, I said, God, so which sermon do you want me to preach? Because there's just a lot in this passage. And this is, the, this is where we're going to go this morning. Um, if you notice up on our board up here, this is our, actually like our theme for the year. Um, and so uh, I want to encourage you, if you missed it or whatever, go back and listen to some of the YouTubes back in January that talked about this passage. Um, if you were around, I encourage you just to uh, go back and be reminded um, because this is this is valuable. This is taken out of Timothy, um, and uh, it's it's truth. Second Kings twenty two nineteen. Since your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become an object of horror and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I have indeed hurt you, declares the Lord. Wow. Therefore, behold, I am going to gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes will not look at all on the devastation that I'm going to bring on this place. Wow. That's a mouthful. Father, I pray right now that you just anoint my lips, my mind. God, give me clarity of thought this morning, clarity of speech, clarity, God, to be able to just flow, God, and what you're wanting to say and what you're wanting to do this morning. Father, open our hearts. No different. Open our minds. No different than you did to the disciples on that beach. When you walked into the, when they were walking down the road, Father, when they, when you showed up in the room, and the scripture says that, you breathe the Holy Spirit upon them, and Father, open their minds to understand the Scriptures. So, Father, I pray this morning, breathe the Holy Spirit upon our minds, so that we can comprehend and understand what you're trying to say to us this morning. Because, Father, we don't want to miss what you're trying to do. So, Father, I give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, I was about nine years old, and it was Easter Sunday. And this was amazing because every year we looked forward to going to my grandparents' house. Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, we'd go to our grandparents' house. My, my dad, he was a single kid, so on his side it was kind of boring just because, you know, he didn't have all the cousins. It was just me and my brother and sister, and we got sick of each other during the week, so I could spend Easter Sunday together and have fun. It was kind of a little bit. But my grandpa, Stuart, oh my goodness. I had aunts and uncles because my mom was like a child of five. So there was like 15 grandkids there. I mean, we were like a full house of people, you know. And, and sometimes, you know, my aunts would be dating people and their side of the family come. We never knew how big that was. And so sometimes that was like twice the size. 
And so we looked forward to going to our grandparents' house. And so after lunch, you know, we we go we go to Wilcox inside for lunch, and then because you know it was smaller, it took a little less time. And then we went to my grandma Stewart's house because it was a bigger family. It took a whole lot of time for dinner. And one of the things that I liked about going to Grandpa Stewart's house, and Grandpa Wilcox did the same thing, but my Grandpa Stewart was known for this, is doing egg hunts. We absolutely loved our egg hunts. And the reason why we loved egg hunts is because every little egg had a prize in it, but there was one egg that always had a special prize every year. Not fail, every single year. And so this one year, Grandpa told us we have a prized egg with $20 in it. Now, you got to remind yourself, this is in the early 80s, okay? Some of y'all you weren't even thought of yet. Uh, some of y'all you weren't thought way before that. <laughs> but, but some of y'all weren't even created yet. Um, but, um, <laughs> not that. Anyway, rabbit hole again. Where am I going? Um, yeah. Wife, you're going to have to help me here. My mind is like... All the place this morning. So anyway, <laughs> so, we're in the, so there's this, so my grandpa told me there's this twenty dollars in this egg, okay? And so we're like frantic. We're like prize egg, twenty bucks, and it's in the eighties. Now if you remember in the eighties, anybody was around at that time, in the eighties you could buy a candy bar for a nickel. Wow. Yeah. Now they're like two bucks. I don't even want to do the inflation price on that. And so, <laughs> you know, you get a coat for like ten cents, fifteen cents. So when someone said $20, all we thought about when we were 9 years old, 10 years old, was the number of candy bars and soft drinks we could get for the entire summer. I mean, imagine when they're that cheap and how many you can get for the whole summer. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot. I remember working in tobacco at 10 years old. I'm up in the rafters hanging tobacco. First job I ever had. 10 years old. Hanging tobacco up in the rafters. And I remember hanging that tobacco and I'm up in that rafters hanging. We get done. And the guy comes over to me and hands me a $110 check. I looked at him, I said, oh, oh, oh. I was 10 years old. I didn't know what to do with $110. $110. I thought I struck it rich. You know, $110 lasted me six months. <laughs> Try that nowadays. <laughs> six months. But Grandpa said that there was $20 in this one egg. So me and my cousins, we're like looking everywhere. Because, you know, he'd stand at the door and say, go. we just, like, start running. And we go everywhere. And you know how it is when you're a kid and you're looking for eggs? You know, it's like, okay, there's an egg. Oh, I see an egg. All right, get out of my way. I know you saw it, but I'm going to get it, you know. We're, like, pushing everybody out of the way. And, you know, we're looking for an egg, but really we're not looking for the egg. We're just listening for the one that says, hey, I found one. And try to, you know, run over and push it out of the way so we can get it. And, and that's exactly what's going on. But this Easter wouldn't happen. Mm -mm. When someone said that they saw an egg, it was a fight is on. I want that $20. And I'm going to do whatever I had to do to get it. So we spent like an hour, and we had found all the eggs but the prize egg. And Grandpa would come out. He'd stand in the middle of the lawn. He'd gather us all around and go, it's real close. I'm telling you, it's real, real close. We look at one another, we're like, there's a tree standing here. Where'd you hide it at? Under the branch? I mean, like, under the roots? You know, I mean, where's it at? So we'd come out front door and we'd gather us all around. It's close to you. It's right under your nose. Where? We, we, we looked at the whole porch. We couldn't find anything. And at, the, at this point, after an hour, you know, because we're young, some of us had quit, some of us got mad and quit. Some of us just said, okay, I'm, I'm just going to do this, but I'm going to do it with a bad attitude, you know, because we're, one, we're still wanting that $20 egg. And all of a sudden, we hear my sister, I found it, I found it, I found it. And you know where the egg was the whole time? When she sat on my grandpa's lap, it was in his front pocket. <laughs> was my laundry grandpa. <laughs> yeah. The treasure was right under our noses the whole time. Didn't even know. The treasure was found with the person. My grandpa. And so we were like some of us were kind of mad, you know, like 
I couldn't do that. But Grandpa was trying to teach a lesson that we really don't think got. And until I sat and really thought about this particular Easter, I don't know if I really got it for all these years, the lesson that he was trying to teach. See, treasure is found in relationships. You, you catch what I'm saying? We are searching for these treasures. We're searching for these things for fulfillment. We're searching for these promises that God has given. And we want the promises and we want the things of God. And we're trying to frantically search all over the yard, look under the cars, look in the trees, when the treasure is attached to the person, Jesus. And there's a story that I want to talk to you about this morning that a king, Josiah, was looking for treasure. And he couldn't find it. He searched everywhere. He, he couldn't find this treasure that he was looking for. So King Josiah, in this similar issue, he desired to please God. And when you look at, when you look at the first verse, the first couple of verses of, of 2 Kings 22, it says that Josiah pleased the Lord and did right as his father David. Now, when you look at the thing, idea that his father David, you would think David was his dad. It, he was. <laughs> Matter of fact, David was like 14 generations away, maybe even possibly 16 generations away from being a relational uh, uh, relational as far as being a dad to Josiah. But the thing is, is that heritage that he had, he had to reach that far back to find godliness in his generation. Think of that. Wow. But there was something in Josiah that is just drawing him to God. I don't know how to really explain it, but you know how someone, they just, they like show up at church or they, or you meet them in a bar somewhere. And I said, a bar. I know you guys are like, what? Well, yeah, a bar. Jesus ate with tax collectors. He went to parties and he won them to him. He didn't get drunk with them. He didn't mess good in their messes, but he loved on them and went to get them to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you got a drinking problem, don't go. <laughs> but if you've been delivered, let's go get some people to Jesus. I'll sit in that smoky bar. I'm a little witness and testify. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's he, he's, he has to look way back, 14, 16 generations. Each day that he began to seek God and to try, try to follow after God, he tried to understand more of God, but there was a problem. He didn't have anything but a heritage to go on. He didn't have anything to go on but the stories that he heard. He didn't have the word of God. He didn't have the treasure that he needed for his life. And the thing is, is this treasure was right under his nose the whole time he didn't even know it. Right under his nose. And so I'm, we're going to look at 2 Kings 22, and we're going to kind of go through some different verses of Scripture here. But one of the things that I want to bring out about Josiah that I think is important to understand is Josiah's history. See, when we read the first couple of verses of 2 Kings, it's actually the conclusion of Josiah's life. And then it tells the story. And to me, that's pretty interesting because we don't think of our conclusion up front. We think of our conclusion at the end. But God already has written your conclusion for your life. How are you aligning to that conclusion? I want you to think about that. God has already wrote the conclusion for your life. How are you aligning to that conclusion? So here we find in 2 Kings 22, the, the, the passage starts off, and, and God's word talks about the fact that Josiah uh, did right in the sight of the Lord and walked entirely in the ways of his dad, David. Now, that's interesting. Why did he walk in the ways of his dad, David? Because he had nothing else to understand God. All he had was his heritage. All he had was his stories. That's all he had. He didn't have good teachers around. He didn't have a good a dad around, a good grandpa. King Josiah started life with a limited understanding of the things of God. Josiah's dad, Amon, and his grandpa, uh, Manasseh, th th these people were extremely evil. 
They were evil. They were with they, they were involved in witchcraft. They were they they destroyed the temple. They I mean they were like really, really displeasing the Lord. Matter of fact, they, they displeased God so bad. Josiah's dad and his grandpa displeased God so bad it brought the judgment of God upon Israel. That's pretty bad. So it's not like he can go talk to dad. It's not like he can go talk to grandpa. He, he can't. He had no he had nothing physically to connect himself to. He had to go back to the stories. See, now some people, I don't understand why they do this, but they're like, well, I don't want to hear the old stories of old when Pentecost happened and great revivals and the little of the spirit and the charismatic happened and this happened. And I don't want to hear the stories. I want it for now. Now, I don't disagree. I do want it for now, but we still need the stories. Because the stories are some things that that's all the people have. Did, did you catch what I'm saying? Because there are some Josiahs in life. They're not in a church somewhere right now. They're not in a place where they're hearing the word of God preached. And because of that, they have to look back and reach to the generations before them and listen to the stories. Until someone like us brings them the word of God. See, Josiah would have been what we consider a stat kid today. But what do I mean by a stat kid? Well, Josiah at eight years old lost his dad. He was assassinated. He was such an evil king that Josiah's dad at 26 years old was assassinated by his own officers. That's pretty evil. His dad and grandpa left him with a very evil heritage. His grandpa was a POW. Yeah, that's a POW, a prisoner of war. And as a result of that, he got this attitude about the things of God that was unnecessary, didn't need it, didn't want it. He had almost this disdain for the things of God. It was sad. And so he didn't have this real put together, my grandpa was a pastor, my daddy is a pastor, my uncle is a pastor. He didn't have all that. He had an heritage of like, I don't want to talk about it. Some of y'all know exactly where I'm at this morning because, and what I'm saying. Because when we look back on our family heritage, like, do I really, am I really? Mom, did you adopt me or something? I'm like none of y'all. You know what I mean? I'm like none of y'all. I'm so different. My thinking is different. My, be, my everything about me is different. Have I, have I been, have, have, did you adopt me or something? I, I, you know? And, and, uh, and so we have this mindset because when we look at our heritage, it's not that we don't want to be part of our family. And I don't know how to say this in, in a more tactful way, but we wish our family was better. And I, I don't mean better than like being, I think you get what I'm saying. And I can imagine Josiah, he's looking at his heritage, his dad and his grandpa, he's like, man, where did I go from this? But there was one thing he learned. He did not want to be like his dad and grandpa. He didn't want any part of that. And so he has this, this heritage that's just awful. Matter of fact, his, his grandpa was so deep in witchcraft and stuff. Second Kings 21, or Second Kings 21, 16 says this. Moreover, Manasseh also shed so much, I want you to catch this, so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end. This was a wicked man. His grandpa was wicked. Josiah's dad, Amon, was just as evil. And we find that in 2 Kings 21, 20 through 21, he said, it says, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord as his father Vaness had done. He followed completely the ways of his father, worshiping the idols of his father had worshiped and bowing down to him, bowing down to them. I mean, these, these men were wicked men. And we look back, some of us look back on our families and our heritage, and we're like, God, how can you use me? I got no foundation. I got nothing to build on. Where do I go? What do I do with this? You know, it's not like I can turn to mom or I can turn to dad and say, hey, explain the Bible to me. You know, the, the sweetest day of my life, and this happened when we met, my wife and I were married, and Angie will remember this, because I'll just put aside myself. 
one of the sweetest days of my life was when I was married to my wife in my 40s. And my mom read the Bible to me for the first time in my life. I didn't come from that heritage. I didn't come from that root. I didn't come from that background. And some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you're like, who do I turn to? Who do I talk to? Who do I lean on? Where do I go from here? And Josiah was feeling the same exact way. Where do I go from here? I know I want God. I know I want to please God. But my goodness, the whole kingdom is wicked. And it's my dad and my grandpa's fault. They led everybody down this path. And it's their fault. What do I do with this mess? How do I fix this? How do I straighten this up? I don't want to be like my dad. I don't want to be like my grandpa. They were wicked men. They did some evil things. They turned the kingdom away from God. What am I going to do? I God, I'm beside myself. So what does he do? Josiah looks back to the stories of his heritage. And in his heritage, his great-great-grandpa was Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a reformer. Hezekiah went in when the temple was destroyed and he went in and he repairs the temple. He begins to restore order or reopens the temple because the temple is actually closed. Yeah, they put closed on the church door. Think of that. <laughs> yeah. Because people were so wicked, they didn't want no part of God. They didn't put clothes on a church door. And so Hezekiah is a reformer. And he goes back and he's hearing the stories of Hezekiah, his great great grandpa. And he's like, you know, my dad didn't show me the example. My grandpa didn't show me the example. I've never had a living example in front of me, but I can remember the stories that others told me about my great great grandpa and how he pleased God, how he changed the nation. How he did great things in the community. And he goes back and he reaches into these stories. And so what was one of the things that, his, that Josiah does? He remembers that his great-grandpa built the temple. He restored the temple. So what does Josiah do? He thinks, well, this is what I'm going to do. The story says, go build the temple. There must be something about the house of God that is so important but Hezekiah, my great-grandpa, spent so much time and energy on that he had to open the house of God, restore the house of God, and get people back in the house. He said, there must be something to this. So I don't know how else to please God. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know how to pray. I wasn't taught these things. But I do know the story tells me, and my grandpa has a great-great-grandpa Hezekiah, that the house is important. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go build the house. I'm going to go restore what's been destroyed. And so he goes and he tells everybody, he's like, you know, I want you to gather all the priests, the Levites, because they seem to know something because they're in the story. Don't know what they do, but they're in the story. And I want you to gather the Levites, and they're supposed to be priests, so I don't even know what the priests are supposed to do. We've got no instructions here, but they're, just tell them that they're priests. Maybe God will give them something. I don't know. And he gets all these people together, and they go and they start building the temple, restoring the walls, restoring the rubble, removing the rubble, getting, getting the mess cleaned up that's going on inside the situation and, and what's going on in that kingdom at that time. And all of a sudden, in the midst of them removing the rubble, they find a treasure. They don't even know what it is. This is what's so funny about it. They have no clue even what it is. And the priest finds this book, and they run to the king, and they say, King Josiah, we found this under the rubble. We don't really know what it is. We think we might know what it is. We, 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 we have an idea what it might be, but we're not sure. We found all kinds of things in the temple, but this is something that we found right under our noses. Remember, you were listening to the stories on how to do this, and I'm kind of commentating here. But anyhow, well, you remember all the stories about how your grandpa, great-grandpa Hezekiah did this? And you remember how that, that we were just trying to do the best thing, thing we can according to the stories? I think we might have some instructions now. And so the priest tells the scribe, he says, I want you to read from the book. And he begins to read from the book. 
And the Bible says that as he begins to read from the book, that all of a sudden, Josiah tears his robe. They're saying, why is he tear his robe? Because in the Jewish custom, somehow he still understood this, tearing your robe was a sign of repentance. Josiah knew at the moment that that book was read, it was the word of God. And the treasure was right under their noses. Sometimes life can have so much rubble so much mess that we miss the treasure that's right underneath us. Right in front of us. Josiah could have missed it. They could have picked it up. Oh, here's another piece of junk. It just threw the book somewhere else. They knew there was something about this book. There was something that grabbed the hold of them. They knew something was about this book. They knew that they had found something, but wasn't sure what it was. But Josiah, in the search for God, knew what it was. Because as soon as he heard it read, he repented and cried out to God. Verse 11 says this, When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robe. Then the king commanded Micaiah, the priest, um, Ayakam, I think is that how you say that? I'm going to tear these names up. The son of Shaphan, Achabar, the son of somebody, and a ship and the scribe. <laughs> and I'm not going to try to say this next word that starts with an A because I may end up sounding like a bad word, so I'm going to go on into a different thing. But it was the king's servant. And this is what they say. Go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and all to do concerning the words of this book that has been found for the wrath of the Lord that burns against us is great because our fathers did not listen to the words of this book to act in accordance with everything it, it, that is written regarding us. See, Josiah found a great, great treasure. He discovered the word of God. Josiah responded with conviction. He responded with humility. He responded with repentance. He Responded with teachability and a recognition for his own need personally and the need universally. My question is, when we hear the word of God, what's our response? Oh, that was good. When we hear the word of God, oh, that must have been for somebody else. When we hear the word I the pastor, I always know my business. <laughs> Believe me, this pastor doesn't know most business of most people. And I kind of keep it that way. Because I want to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit. But he recognized his own need. And what's interesting is the Bible does not say how much was read. It doesn't even say what was read. That leaves kind of guessing. Which is okay. Because I can only imagine, because I, I, I know myself, if, 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 I, if I was in Josiah's shoes, and I, all, the only thing I have to, and I'm trying to please God, I want to love God, I want to do like my great-great-grandpa Hezekiah did when he was a reformer, and I, I want my conclusion to be that I did right in the eyes of God, not that I was a wicked king. I want my conclusion to be different than my father, than my grandpa. I, I, I know without doubt that I'm sure Josiah, when he heard this book, the law, the word of God, I'm sure that he didn't sit here and say, okay, that's enough reading. I'm getting bored now. You know? I, I'm sure that he didn't... He, he didn't do the Pentecostal hit enough. You know what I mean? You're reading the word. It's, you can't stay awake. I'm sure he wasn't doing that. Josiah was sitting here and probably saying, more, give me more. I want to know more. Show me more. I need to know what's in this book. 
I need to know what I'm doing wrong so I can get it right. I need to know what I'm doing right so I can keep it right. I need to know how God wants it done so that I can please him. And I'm sure that there was something inside of Josiah that burned. Like Jeremiah that said the word of God was in him shut up in his bones like a fire burning. And I'm sure Josiah, when he heard the word, it was like a burning sensation inside of him that was saying, yes, this is it. This is finally the answer. This is the treasure I've been searching for. This is what I needed this whole time. And you know, the stories are good. And you know what? The story is four generations old now. There's some things in this story that's not necessarily true. You know, it kind of goes back to the whole illustration of the ham. You know, great-grandma walks in, and the woman is sitting here, and she's cut the ends of the ham off before she threw it into the oven. Grandma, great-grandma walks up to her and says, Darling, why'd you do that for? Well, my mama says that the best way to cook a ham every year is to cut the ends of the ham off and stick it in the oven in the pan. Honey, I to cut the ends off because my pan was too small. <laughs> And some of us keep cutting the ends of the ham off, which could be some really good pieces of ham. But some of us keep cutting the ends of the ham off because we think that's the way it's supposed to be, when in all reality, the pan was just too small. There's nothing wrong with the ham. The pan was too small. The pan had a limited perspective. The pan had the issue. Not the ham. And see, Josiah wanted the word of God. He pursued it. See, when we hear the word of God, we can do one of two things. We can harden our heart like Pharaoh and watch the miracles and let the miracles of God still harden our heart. You're saying, oh, nobody would do that. Oh, yeah, I know people that have seen miracle after miracle. I know churches that have seen miracle after miracle of God done in their midst. And they've hardened their heart and even made statements like, I don't want Holy Spirit here. Oh, a church wouldn't say that. Oh, yeah, they would. Because religion binds people. Religion slaves people. The stories of the past that may have some truth, but don't have the whole truth. And so we get trapped in that. See, when we hear the word of God, then we harden our heart like the Pharisees that knew the truth, but was so bound to what was written, they couldn't understand why it was written and to whom it was written to. And this is why when you have a woman caught in adultery, the Pharisees and Sadducees just could not go into Samaria. That's why the disciples were so upset when Jesus went into Samaria, because you know the Jews and the Samaritans hated one another. There was so much bigotry and hatred going on with one another that they would not even go to each other's towns. And this is why they were so upset that Jesus would go into the town. Why? Because Jesus was the one to forgive, and forgiveness was for everybody regardless. But see, we have a religious crowd called Pharisees and Sadducees so bound to this. They thought they were the chosen ones and they were the only ones that could go to heaven. It don't matter if you're Pentecostal, Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever you are. If you believe in this and you're saved and Jesus lives in your heart, you can go to heaven. But I can tell you what, it don't matter what denomination you're from either. Because if you don't have Jesus in your heart, regardless of your denomination, you're still not going to go to heaven. Because there's only one way to get there and that's through Jesus. Regardless of that background, regardless of where we're from, regardless of our heritage, regardless whether or not how we had to pursue God at the beginning. And here is the beautiful thing about Josiah, and I love about Josiah's story. Josiah had nothing to start with but a story. All he had was something that he remembered in the past from his great-grandpa. That's all he had. He didn't have anything else. But here's the beautiful thing about Josiah that separates him from so many people nowadays is at least he started. Can't don't you catch that? At least he started. And when he started, God revealed the treasure. So my question to you this morning Throw that to the side again. Um, my question to you this morning is: Have you started? 
Have you started? You might say, well, yeah, I've started, okay. You started, I applaud you for that. That's, that's great, I'm glad you started. Have you been digging? Because here's the thing, is that unlike Josiah, our treasure's not hidden. We can go to any store and get one. I mean, you can go to some places that sell stuff that you just should not be looking at and still have a Bible in there. Like, well, no, that doesn't make sense, but it's that it happens. Our treasure is right here. Right here. The Bible, the Word, is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. The Word is living and active, sharper than me any two-edged sword. The good one, dividing the wicked from the righteous, that's what it's doing. Revealing and exposing is what it's doing. So what does that mean? The word of God is my weapon, like Jesus when he's tempted. I can speak and proclaim the word of God over my life when I'm depressed or I'm discouraged or I got anxiety going on or I got fear and I got something going on. I can say, God's not giving me a spirit of fear. He's giving me a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. But I'm confused. I don't have to stay confused. But I can say, uh-uh. The enemy's the author of confusion. God's not a god of confusion. He's God is a god of stable mind, understanding of peace. That when 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 the, my, my world gets rocky and, and everything else and things get a little messy and everything else, I can say, uh-uh, no, 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 no. Because the word tells me that Jesus is my rock. He's the one that keeps me stable. Everything around me may crumble, but that's okay. That when I go in and it seems like the whole world's against me, that I can go into Psalms and says, although 10,000 fall at my side, even though the enemy rises up against me in Psalm chapter 3, I'm not going to fear. Because my God's my shelter. My God's my refuge. My God is everything that I need. All the treasure. All. In the word. And what I love about John chapter 1, John sums it up this way. And again, I'm going to commentate this. You can go read John chapter 1 for yourself. But summing up the first chapter of John, John basically says this Jesus is the word. So what, what, what does that tell me? It tells me a lot. He's the treasure. He's the treasure. That I need to have a different perspective about the scriptures because if Jesus is the word that has become flesh and made his dwelling among us, then I need to have a different perspective about the scriptures and realize that it's not just a book that was written by men who were inspired by God, but it is God's word spoken to me. Those promises are mine. That that new identity he talks about in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that all the old junk passed away, behold, all the brand, all things been brand, brand, made brand new, he's talking about me. He's talking about you. The word. The word. The question we have to ask ourselves, are we going to be Josiah this morning, because see, Josiah was kind of at a crossroads. I want you to think about this. He was at a crossroads. He could have chose to be like his dad and his grandpa, and it probably would have gotten popular with the family, to be honest. But what did he decide to do? Be different. <laughs> be unique. Be what God's called him to be, not what his family thought he should be. And that was to please God. And in his pursuit, the treasure is revealed. What is in your mess that is a treasure? Because under the rubble of the temple, under the mess of life, that Josiah was going through, God had a treasure in plain sight. What treasure is in your mess?